Well, hello everyone. Thank you for coming to our session. I uh, appreciate y'all being here. My name's Tim Walker. I'm with UNIST. And uh, we're going to kind of have the session broken into two halves today. I'm going to kind of do the first part. So I'll be going through and giving you a little bit about what the systems are and various pieces and things like that. And then after that's where you get to the real meat of the, of the whole presentation. We're going to have a couple of my friends here from Ford. So we're going to have Dave Stevenson and Ethan Huey. They're going to come up and they're going to tell you what they found as they've been going and doing it. So we don't have too many rules here, but the, one of the rules we have is if you have a really hard, tough question, ask them. They have, they have all the answers over there, so make sure you ask them. And Dave was just saying a few minutes ago how much he was looking forward to, uh, to having all these questions. So make sure you, you really give him, you know, let him get his uh, bang for his buck over here. So starting off, I gotta stay in front of the mic, sorry. Starting off, uh, what is MQL? Well, the nice thing about MQL is it's a pretty self-explanatory name. So there's the two pieces to it. There's the minimum quantity. And the minimum quantity means that you're putting a very small amount of fluid on there. How much depends on different things. It can depend on materials and tools and operations. But typically, they'd say up to, at least in the DIN standard, up to about 50 milliliters per hour. And they might go up to a high of about 550 milliliters. Other folks in other places go up to 500 milliliters. But as you'll see in a moment when we look at compared to flood coolant, that's a very, very small amount compared to what you'd put on with flood. The other piece of the puzzle is that it's a lubrication. So instead of trying to go back and use a lot of fluid to kind of wash away that heat, instead you're going to go back and use some lubrication to help not, help that, not have that heat be generated. Think about what you do in your car engine, right? You put there, when you got things rubbing together, you put oil in there to try to keep it the heat down and, and decrease what's generated through friction. Same idea is happen, happening here when you go back and you have that lubrication on there. So it's a small amount of the lubrication that's going and put on. Uh, in most cases now, when you put that small amount of oil on, part of what helps do part of the cooling on there is that oil gets consumed in the process. The heat that is there helps evaporate it and it helps uh, decrease some of the, the, the uh, heating overall. So overall, when you get said and done, if you're putting on about the right amount of fluid, the chips will come out just about dry. So you can see up here on the slide, it talks about less than 2% of the fluid left on the chips. So the parts are dry, the, the uh, chips are dry, and uh, it makes it a much nicer process. So when I talked about small, I tried to give some sort of graphic way of demonstrating what I mean when I say less. So this is a picture, uh, and this, I tried to make it to scale. And as you can see here, I have Godzilla. It's the old Japanese Godzilla, so that's the first one. If you're a Godzilla fan, you'll know that there were many generations, and as it got more and more Americanized, it got bigger and bigger from eating Big Macs or something. So this is the first Godzilla, the smallest of all the Godzillas. And if that's how much flood coolant is being put on, around 30,000 to 60,000 milliliters per hour, we're the little ladybug at the bottom, because you remember, we were down around 50 milliliters per hour. So in comparison, when we say a minimum quantity, we mean it really is truly a very, very small amount of fluid in comparison to what you're doing with flood. The benefits of MQL fall into three main areas, or at least we'd like to break them down into three areas. First, it helps the employee, then it can help the uh, environment, and it also helps the enterprise. So what do we mean by that? Well, when we talk about helping the employee, uh, it means that the, a lot of the, the, um, the side effects that would come from having that flood coolant out there uh, go away. So you have the coolant being um, sprayed in, it's hitting that rotating spindle and tool, it makes a big mist, it sprays all over the place, and that gets out. They've put measurement devices on the operator, they put them over there by the, by the uh, console where you're going back and controlling it, and in both cases they found there's actually a lower amount of mist from a mister, from an MQL system, than there is on flood coolant because just it's not being generated as much. Because you figure we're making a small amount of that, that aerosol and we're aiming at a specific spot instead of having it thrown everywhere because of the spindle. So, so you have less of the uh, aerosol in the air. And what's in there in most cases is a, a MQL lubricant. And most MQL lubricants are biodegradable. They're, they're, they're environmentally friendly, which we'll talk about in a minute. But that means as you're breathing it in and you're getting it on you, you're not getting on that fluid, which is your water, plus whatever additives are on, plus the biocides you put in and everything else that goes along with it. So uh, from as far as from an uh, employee health factor, just having the, what's in the air, what's around the machine is, is better. Also, you don't have the, all the fluid that goes on the floors. So many of you probably have around your machines probably some sort of mats or kitty litter or something to help uh, eliminate slip and fall risks. With MQL, you don't need all that stuff because you don't have a lot of the fluids on the floor in the first place. 
Also, um, if you have a lot of parts handling, and I know Ford, they use a lot of machines to go back and do it, but in smaller shops, you may have someone who's picking up parts and moving them around and doing things. Those parts aren't, um, aren't slippery, they're not wet, they don't have a lot of fluids on them as well. So again, it goes back and helps. So all those kind of things make it much better for MQL. You'll notice also the uh, dermatitis issue. We talked about what you were breathing. Well, if you've got your, uh, your hands into that flood cooling a lot, you'll notice a lot of people may get rashes or dermatitis, dermatitis or sores. Uh, those go away as well because, again, it's just not there. And what's not there doesn't cause you harm. It can help the environment because you're getting rid of almost all of that fluid. So if you go back and look, uh, one plant, um, the, I think it was a Ford plant, had a reduction of 99.8% of the water that they used. So you think about that, that's 99.8% of the, of the water which isn't there to cause a problem. And in a lot of cases, you know, here in America, generally we're lucky, there's lots of water available. But in a lot of places around the world, that's not necessarily true. So it's very helpful not having to go back and, and process that water and clean it. Uh, it also uses less energy than you would using flood coolant. Because if you think about all the equipment that's on the machine, uh, going back and just dealing with water and the fluids that are going through it, the pumps recycling, you know, recirculating all that equipment on there, you can get rid of it. You don't need to have that anymore. So you can cut down the energy usage on your machine. So from an energy perspective, your footprint's smaller. From a, a waste material, your footprint's smaller. And then um, both of those help, uh, reduce it, uh, help reduce what it is. So that's why it's environmentally friendly to go back and do it. Plus, if you count the fluid disposal, there's none of it because there's no fluid to dispose of, so all of those help. And it helps the enterprise, so the third piece of the puzzle here, because you can go back and do different things when you don't have all of that mess that's being made because you're going back and cutting. So if you're a bigger plant and you have different cells, you can make the cells smaller because you can move pieces closer together, closer to the machines. You don't have to move things as far. Uh, people can be closer to it because I'm not making that big mess and not going back and having to, to worry about what's getting all over the place. Also, you can um, um, lower a lot of the, um, well, it helps the machine too because on the machine, a lot of that same stuff which is bad for the person running the machine isn't terribly great for the machine either. So that same mist and that same stuff that we got on into the person and caused problems will get into the electronics on the controls and it can cause corrosion there. It can help corrode paint uh, that's on the machine, water cause rust, and so you may put other things inside the water and all that other stuff you're adding on. But all of those go away when you go back and, and get rid of that water-based coolant to, uh, to go move towards an MQL and towards an oil that goes with that. So you can eliminate the paint, the paint gets better, the, the uh, corrosion that goes along with the water goes away, and it generally just helps the, the enterprise overall. Now when you change one piece of the puzzle, everyone knows that machining is a very complex process. There's lots and lots of pieces on there, lots of moving pieces even, spinning pieces, and so there's lots of things that go back in there. And if you go back and you're trying to change the, the overall the system, when you change one piece of the system, often it means there's going to be a change in other parts of the system. You can't just change the one independently. And I'm going to say that with a little bit of a caveat because it depends on how much you're trying to go back and refine and get things better. So with Ford, where a few pennies uh, could go back and over the course of an entire production run could go back to make millions of dollars, it's very important to make sure you have everything uh, put together and so that you're doing the most optimum system possible. In other cases where maybe you're a job shop and you're not running so much on there, you may be able to live with a little bit more slop in what you're going in here. So how much you're going to change or what you're going to change is going to depend a little bit on what your goals are and what you're trying to need. But it's important to know that quite often when you go back and you make a change in that, in that lubrication part, that will have ripples that can go back across, especially if you're trying to go back and squeeze every uh, piece of, uh, of, um, of efficiency you can out of the whole process in there. And that's a lot what these two gentlemen, when I get done here talking, they're going to come up and talk to you about what they've done outside of it. Because uh, um, what I'm going to talk about here today is really more on my part is the, the applicator itself. That's where I know more. And then, and then uh, Dave and Ethan are going to talk to you more about what they found on the other elements of it. So when you're going back and doing MQL, we said there's this very small amount of fluid you're putting out, right? We're putting out that minimum amount of that lubricant out there. So not too surprisingly, when you do that, it's important to make sure that you're getting that lubricant where you want it and you're getting the amount you want there. If you have a, you know, a small amount of fluid that you're, you know, a little bit of aerosol you're putting to this point and you're pointing over that way, well, what happens? 
You don't get any lubricant there, and you're cutting dry. So it's very important, and we, we, what we say internally is that we, MQL is more process sensitive than is flooding, because in flooding, you're putting a lot of fluid everywhere, and it's just covering everything, and it hides a whole multitude of sins. Well, with MQ, MQL, you have to be more careful about where you're going back and making sure you're getting that, that aerosol right where you want it when you're doing the cut. There's several different ways you can apply MQL, and today we're talking specifically about one. So just to kind of walk you down the tree here, you can, we're talking about MQLs and CNC, so the top box up there. And then you could go back and you could use external nozzles, or you could be going through the spindle. Today we're going to talk about going through the spindle, so we're not talking about nozzles, uh, external nozzles at all. And then you have single channel and you have dual channel. We'll talk a little bit about what those mean, but today as you go back and we talk about it, we're going to talk about dual channel MQL. So by dual channel, what I mean is that the air and the oil are transported separately, hence the two, right? That's the two for the dual. Uh, the, uh, the other one is single channel MQL, and with that, it means that I mix everything up at the, at the applicator, and I push that mist or that aerosol through all the way to uh, the end of the tool where it's going to come out. So that would be single channel. Dual channel means that I'm going back and I'm keeping those two separated, the air and the oil, as the two separate channels, the dual channels, all the way as close as I can to the, uh, to the tip of the tool, which is usually coming into the, uh, to the uh, tool holder. The other part of it is through the spindle. So through the spindles, probably you're all familiar with, it's just like through the spindle uh, when you're going back and doing coolant. The only difference here is that by, because it's dual channel, because I keep the air and the oil separated, I have an extra tube going down through that hole I have in the draw bar, which carries the oil. So I usually have the air coming out on one side, and I have the oil coming down, and another tube inside, and that's my two channels coming down through the draw bar down into the tool holder. So that's kind of what the term means as we're going back and talking about it, and you'll see me uh, reference that a lot. Now, I had to come up with some criteria to talk about as I'm doing, um, do, you know, doing the things. How do I say what's good, what's bad, you know, what's better, what's worse? So, liking acronyms and trying to be you know, a little bit uh, memorable here, I came up with STAR. So, simple, timely, repeatable, and accurate. Simple is how easy is it to maintain, how easy, easy is it to do for the operator, you know, how easy is the system overall. Timely, how fast do things happen when I say I want something to change until I actually see the change. Uh, repeatable and accurate, uh, rather than break them apart here, I'm going to kind of put them together because I think it's easier. So you can see the targets over there on the side. So I don't know how many of you are shooters, but how close all the, all the little holes together would be a group. And so and I can go back and I can be highly um, repeatable, meaning my group is small, so all of my, my little holes are close together, but I miss the target, so I'm not very accurate. I can go back and be, at least on average, highly accurate, and I have my holes all over the place, but not one of them hit where I really wanted to. They just, on average, end up where I want to be. So that would be highly, um, that would be accurate, but you don't have any repeatability. You're going all over. The goal is to have your group small, to have all those holes in a small group, and for that group to be on target. That's being accurate and repeatable. So what you want to go do, because we talked about MQL means I'm putting a small amount on, and I have to put it in the right spot. You want to make sure that you're right what that amount is, and you want to make sure that spot's right where you're putting on. So I'm going back in there. So when we're going back and talking about MQL and CNCs, the reason we pick dual channel through spindle is because it's the best technical solution for the job. There are other ways you can do it. All of them have trade-offs, and like everything in life, it's all you know a very uh, uh, a variety of. Uh, of of compromises, but dual channel through spindle is the best. And why do we say that? Well, going back and using that criteria, simple is the fact that when I go through the spindle like that, I'm basically using my uh, tool as the nozzle. So the holes of where the uh, aerosol is going to come out are in the tool, and they don't change, and operators can't mess with them. It's not somebody going back and knocking a nozzle away or doing something wrong. Every time I change the tool, I get the new nozzle where I want it. So it makes it very simple from the operator uh, intervention part. Uh, timely is good because I get a low response time. And what a response time is, it's the time from when I make the change to when I actually see the change down at the end. So if you think of like a single channel system, let's say I have 10 feet of hose going to, from my applicator to the top of the spindle. Then it has to go down through the spindle, through the tool holder, and through the tool until I see it. 
Now, if I'll go back and making my, my mix over here of my aerosol, when I make that change, it has to travel all the way through that 10 feet down through all those pieces and down to the end of the tool before I actually see that change. And that takes time. So the response time on a single channel system like that would be relatively slow. On the flip side, if I have the oil in the air coming down to that same spot right near the tip, and then I make a change, that change is almost instantaneous because the, the oil flow happens, again, almost immediately. The air flows right there. It doesn't have to travel very far, in most cases through the tool holder length and then through the tool itself, which is relatively short distance, and you get pretty fast response times. So it's much faster if you go back and do the dual channel uh, through spindle than it would be the other ones. Accuracy is good because I'm pretty consistent on the where, where I'm putting it. Again, it comes back to the fact that my tool has those holes in it, and that doesn't change. It's true every time. So I'm pretty accurate on where that's going to be. It's consistent over time, which helps with repeatability, and it, it makes it so that I, um, I'm always getting the same thing the same time every way. And then one more thing on accurate repeatability of the dual channel versus a single channel is that on a single channel system, I have that, that aerosol, that mist coming down through those pieces. And when it hits the spindle, the spindle is rotating. So you know, how many of you have ever ridden a teacup at a, at a fair? Well, two at least, so that's good. The rest of you should try it. <laughs> um, so what happens on a teacup, right? It spins around, you go to the outside, you're getting centrifuged out to the outside. Well, the same thing's happening to all those little droplets in the aerosol. And depending on the size of the droplets, how much mass they have, how fast you're spinning, they go to the outside too. And just like on the ride, when you're sitting there on the outside, you stay to the outside until it slows down, right? Then you come out. Well, the same thing happens on single channel systems as it goes through. Some, the, some percentage of that fluid is going to get pushed off to the sides. It's not coming through when you're cutting. When you slow down the spindle, it's going to come out then. That changes your, your accuracy. And then depending on how consistent the, the droplet sizes are, changes repeatability in that as well. So but all those go away with a dual channel system. And again, that's why it's technically the best. It gives you the best answer to the problem for those reasons. We're going to talk about four pieces, or I'm going to talk about four pieces today. So the applicator, the rotating union, the spindle, and the tool holder. So starting off with the applicator, there's two basic types of applicators out there. And I want to be up right up front. I'm a partisan in this, this particular thing. Right? We at Eunice make a particular type of applicator. Obviously, we make it because we think it's the best. And you're going to see that reflected. So, but just to let you know up front, I'm biased. Um, so there's two basic approaches that we go back and do. There's a volumetric approach and there's a time-based slow approach. So the volumetric approach uses a, 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 it's a pump. So you have a cylinder and you have a piston in there and you go back and you make so much volume within that pump by moving the piston back within the cylinder and that's how much volume you have and then you push it out at a certain rate and that's how you get your flow rate. So a very simple idea going back and doing it. The time-based flow has a little bit different uh, pr uh, operating principle behind it. Instead, you're going back and you're having a flow that's going back at a, at a rate, and then you open and close a valve, some sort of metering valve, at a certain rate to allow a certain amount through. And so the longer you open the valve, the more it comes through. The shorter time the valve, the less comes through. And so you go back and you control it that way. Both systems can work, and both systems have their pluses and minuses. Um, so looking at the simple here, uh, the nice thing about the volumetric system is it's, it's, it's simpler in design and concept. Uh, going back and doing it. If you think about, if you go to a doctor's office and the doctor's going to give you a shot and they want to make sure they're giving you the right amount of fluid and all that, what do they do? They pull out a syringe, right? Syringe, you have a cylinder, you have a piston, you pull out until it hits the three or five or whatever it happens to be on that, that thing for how many milliliters and you go back and you put it in there. The reason they do it, it's simple, it's hard to get wrong. You can have a thick fluid, you can have a thin fluid, it can be hot, it can be cold. It doesn't really matter because that volume is that volume and it's always that volume. So, so that's, that's the advantage of it. Now the, the sensitivity on our part when we do that is because we're volumetrically based is if something changes that volume, that causes us error. So one thing that's going on as you're doing things inside the spindle and that is pressures can be fairly high. And what happens, if I take a balloon and I blow into it, what happens? The pressure inside gets higher than the atmospheric pressure. What happens to the balloon? It expands. It gets bigger, right? The volume changes in there. So we have what we call system elasticity, which means that if we go back in there and we have components which grow, like say tubing grows under pressure, then our volume increases a little bit. We may have bubbles in there, air bubbles somewhere, which would shrink, and they would get squeezed, which would change the volume too. 
that's from a sensitivity perspective where we're sensitive and why when we build our systems, we've been very, very careful and very, very deliberate in our designs to make sure that we don't have elasticity in there because we know that's the weakness of our particular system going and doing that. On the time-based flow system, you, they can run a higher pressure, so they can go back and do some advantages to that uh, based on the high pressure. Um, but there's more moving pieces, and they're sensitive to both the figure you're doing, how much fluid is flowing over time. So any changing in the timing and any changing in the fluid flow is going to cause errors there. So if you go back and you have a fluid where the viscosity changes, let's say you're in a hot plant you know, in the summer and it plants cold in the winter, and, and, uh, and so the fluid might have a change of viscosity. That would change the, how fast the fluids roll, a flow, which would, might require you to go back and make a change in your system, a calibration of some sort to go back and do that. Or if you had something where, you're, where you're, you're, the, the, uh, the metering valve didn't open and close quite the same way it did after you know, 2 million cycles, after it did the first you know, 100,000 cycles, again, that's something you'd have to go back and can, can add some errors in there. And you can do it, uh, have problems with that. The other thing is, is that on the volumetric system, I don't have to do any particular calibration because I'm using physical properties, right? I'm using diameters and distances, and so it's relatively easy to go back and make sure I have the right volumes. With the time-based flow ones, you have to calibrate more because, again, thick fluids flow different than thin fluids, and, and there's a lot of variations in there. So it's a little bit more complicated as you're going back and doing it in there. Both of them can put it out. They just have a little bit of difference on that simplicity uh, factor. From a timeliness basis, uh, we're doing dual channel through spindles, so they behave identically. So really, if you're going back and you're putting that fluid out at the tip of, the, of, the, uh, of that tube at the end, we call it a fluid delivery tube because at units we're very creative in our names. And, uh, and others call it a lance, which I think is actually a kind of cooler name. But um, if you go back and do that on the end of the tube, it doesn't matter which system you're putting it out in. You're both going to be putting out the fluid at that point, that time. So it's a, there's really no difference between the two systems there. Accuracy, the accuracy, the nice thing, and again, talking about volumetric accuracy, um, I'll say the same thing over and over here in the slide, so I won't say it over when I'm talking as much, but the, it's inherently accurate volumetrically because that's the way the system designs. It's designed around a volumetric pump, so it's always volumetric accurate. Uh, and so that part makes it very good for both accuracy and for repeatability. If we're going to go back and, you know, that's why doctors do it. Again, doctors do it because they can go back and they can use a syringe and they can do it a hundred times and they'll always get the same amount out regardless of fluid, regardless of temperature, regardless of anything else. Uh, the time-based flow one, like I already mentioned before, is a little bit more sensitive to things that would change either the flow rate or that timing of going back and doing it. So there's a little bit more in there which can cause some grief as you're going back and looking at them. Going to the next piece of the puzzle is the spindle. So what we're looking for in the spindle, because like I said, we're sticking a tube down through the, through the jaw bar of the spindle. So in order to stick a tube down there, something which is really nice is to have a nice straight line. So if you have a spindle, which maybe you have something which articulates on there, you have a different sort of arm type of situation, it doesn't work really well for going back and doing it through spindle that way. Another thing which can cause issues is this say I have a, I'm trying to stick that tube and I need to support that tube, right? Because it's going to be inside that spinning spindle. I don't want it to have any sort of vibration or harmonic form. So instead, I go back and I put supports along the length of that spindle. Well, let's say I had a spindle and they designed it for whatever reason. So it had a really tight constriction on the top and a really tight constriction at the bottom. And then it got bigger in between. Well, I can't actually stick anything through to have supports to go back and support in the middle because I got those restrictions at both ends. So the spindle, they do the draw bar now. It has to be designed in such a way we can actually stick a tube down in there and, and support it and do it. The union will probably be a specific union for doing uh, dual channel through spindle work. Um, the reason is because now I have to have a way of not just for fluid to come in like you would on a flood coolant, but I have to have a way of having both the air and the oil come in separately and kept separate through that whole channel. So it'll probably be a, 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 a union designed to go back and do it. It's probably going to be tied to the type of applicator where you're going to do it. I mentioned before, in our particular systems, we're sensitive to things which be cause elasticity. So in, in the case of the union, that might be places where air could get trapped. So we've done a lot of work in making sure that the unions we work with don't have that in there. Uh, the people who do the time-based flow systems, they too have done a lot of work in optimizing their unions to make sure it works really well with their system. And so most likely you're going to get a union that is designed to work with whatever type of system you go back and choose in order to get the optimum uh, uh, performance from it. And last but not least is the tool holder. 
So this is one piece here where um, a lot of times, especially if you're using cat style tool holders, people forget about. So we've done all that work of getting it from the applicator down to the, uh, the spindle through the rotating union, down to the tip there, right where it's coming into the tool holder. And we've done it through a dual channel, so we have all that nice response. And then you get into the tool holder, and let's say you have a big area inside your tool holder. And again, with the cat with the tapers on the inside, that's a lot more common. What happens there? Well, the same thing would happen inside the spindle, right? It's still spinning just as fast as the spindle is, and you still have a place for all that uh, fluid to get centrifuged out to the side. So you don't want that to happen. You want to go back and make sure you have a nice, even, and, and, and direct as possible flow to go back through, the, uh, uh, through that tool holder into the, the shank of the tool and down through the tool. So the way that's done is they make uh, inserts to go back and, and, and make sure that's true. On the case of HSK tool holders, which a lot of people use, and I know Ford and those guys use, there's a pretty uh, commercially available uh, MQL inserts are out there. You can go back and Google them or do your favorite search engine, and you'll go back and find MQL inserts to go back and do it. Uh, for those of you who are using CATs, it's a lot less common. And then stop by, see us at our booth. We can give you some recommendations and show you some different things you can go to do it. But if you're going to go back and, and trying to get that, that performance out of there, don't forget that last mile. You know, it's like you know, if you're doing cable systems, you can have it up to the place, but if they can't get it to your house for that last mile problem, it doesn't quite work. Don't forget the last mile of the tool holder as well when you're going back in and looking at MQL. So that's my part. Now you've got the overview. Now you're going to get the experts up here. And coming up is Mr. Dave Stevenson, Dr. Dave Stevenson. <laughs> All right, for the Ford part of the talk, we're going to talk, um, I'll give an overview, just what we do at MQL. Um, then, because of manufacturing talk, we're going to talk safety, quality, schedule, talk, uh, costs. So we'll talk about safety, what our machine tool modification we need to do, our processing and dimensional control for quality. And then we'll talk a little about oils and tooling. And most of that is pretty straightforward, except for the tooling. So I'll talk about everything else. And actually, Ethan's going to talk about the tooling, because that's actually the hardest part. So I'll give an overview of this. Uh, now, I've been known to take these offline. What do I do here? I just punch that button? Yeah, that's for it. Wish me luck. <laughs> there you oh, go. No. There you go. <laughs> right that one there? All right, MQL at four. Hey, huh? um, two channel, dual channel, through spindle MQL is our standard or bill of process machining operation for a lot of our most important components. Those are aluminum transmission prismatics, so that'd be your converter housing valve body and your case, aluminum engine heads, aluminum and gray iron engine blocks, and also cast and forge cranks for the oils, cross holes, and the balancers. So that is a, a big bulk of the machining we do in-house. The only thing that's really not on here, some of the gears and the CGI compacted graphite iron diesel blocks. Pretty much everything is standard MQL, although we certainly have a lot of wet systems, legacy systems still in operations. All our new equipment is MQL. Now, why would we do that? Well, we'll give you more history here. Um, production, since 2004, Livonian uh, Van Dyke transmission were among the first. We did some in Germany as well at their, uh, I think, the Trag manual transmission. Cologne and Cryova in Europe were our first engine launches. And I'll go with MAP. We have a lot of worldwide applications. Our main machine suppliers are MAG, Grobe, and Heller for our CNCs. We also have Exitar for Lays for cranks. System suppliers of Bielomatic has been our main supplier since 2004. And recently, Unist was qualified last year, so we have both systems. We have about, and we actually don't know, or at least I don't know, but we have around 700 two-channel systems globally. The reason we don't know that is the way we pay for them and budget them and track them is not global, but it's based on plant or program. So you have to call a lot of people up and find out. And if you're supposed to be the MQL expert, it's embarrassing to call people up and ask how many systems we got. So I don't do a lot of that. All right. But we got about 700. We actually probably got more, but that's the number I can document. So here's a, a sort of a map, and Ethan, you can correct me. I'm going to try to go from, do we have a this mouse show? Can we point with a mouse? All right, never mind. All right. <laughs> Starting in the upper left, North America, we have in, uh, in the U.S. We, and Canada, so we have basically Livonia, Van Dyke uh, and, uh, transmission, and then uh, Romeo engine and Windsor engine in the Detroit area. We have Sharonville trans and Rossonville components. Sharonville transmission in Ohio. Then as we move farther south, Chihuahua and Arapuato in Mexico, Taubaté in Brazil. We go back to Brazil, Bridge End in Wales, Cologne in Germany, Craiova in Romania. We go to Sanand in India, 
And then uh, Chongqing in China, engine and transmission. Did I miss Aerop Auto transmission? So I think that's all of them. So it's a lot of places. And it's not just a bunch of different plants. It's a bunch of different components and a bunch of different regions where a lot of the issues that, that uh, Tim came, talked about come up. Now, here's the benefits. What do we really see? Why are we doing this? And why have we been doing it for 15 years and, and haven't given up? And the answer really, uh, we'll talk about it. One is reduced operator mist exposure, as, uh, as Tim mentioned. Uh, the main reason I can tell you I've seen the business case for why we adopted MQL, and it's all money. So it's a lower system life cycle cost if you take into account everything, which is floor space, equipment, energy, uh, and, and cycle time then it's a, it's a much better, it's a, we found it to be a much better process by about 15% based on what we were doing. We have improved throughput because we run higher feed rates, so that's good. Uh, we have reduced floor space, we reduce energy and water usage as Tim talked about. If you're building a plant in a lot of places, an engine plant, if you need 5,000 gallons of water a day, you're gonna have to build a water treatment plant next to it, so we avoid some of that. Uh, and we have increased flexibility. If we want to move things around, it's not quite the big plumbing job that it would normally be, so we can move things a little bit more easily. Challenges, the main one is heat. And if I was better with computers, I would make those letters flaming and rotating somehow, because that is our big problem. We generate a lot of heat, and we got to get rid of it because it's not good for the tooling or the part. Uh, we do have to, some changes. I mean, there's nothing unique here, but we have to pay attention to our machine tool design and how we integrate them. Uh, the biggest, some of the big challenges are how we control dimension without coolant, because a lot of people control dimension by dumping cold water on the part. Certainly that's how we've always done it in the auto business. Um, oil effects, dosage and residue, I'll talk a little bit. Um, those are a challenge. Um, tooling performance and cost is probably our, one of our bigger issues. We are, life cycle cost is much lower, but if you look at every component, the one component that is higher is tooling. It costs a little more. And Ethan will talk, that's Ethan's job to tell us why that is. And, and actually, one of the problems we have in North America is actually supply-based familiarity. We go to buy tools, everybody makes wet tools, nobody makes them too well. Not, it's a much smaller market in North America, so a lot of tools we buy is actually from Europe for that reason. Um, we'd like to see that change, and there are differences, and that's another thing Tim, uh, excuse me, uh, Ethan will talk about. So before we get into it, we'll talk a little bit about safety, and there's not a lot here to talk about, but we'll talk about the hazards, and there's really two. One is aerosol mist, and I think that uh, Tim mentioned that when you start breathing it. And here we're talking about occupational exposure for people in a high volume plant where you're gonna be breathing this every day. You know, every 90 seconds you're getting another dose. So it's, it's a big problem. I mean, over time, that's very bad for you. And fire and uh, explosion potential is the other issue. It's a neat oil system. So you're gonna have oily chips, potentially aluminum chips. So for the mist, we use this in a well ventilated, if, if you have a, this is also a concern for water-based coolants, but you want to use this in a well-ventilated area, and if you have a high volume application like we do, you need to enclose the machines in a, with negative internal pressure, and we use HEPA, so high-efficiency particle filters. Um, and actually, it's a worthwhile thing to look at is a NIOSH 98116, it's a government uh, book. If you Google that, you can get it for free. It tells you about risks of metalworking uh, exposures from NIOSH, and it's worth reading. Uh, for fire and explosion, it's standard precaution for any type of need oil system. So if you're doing any gear cutting or where you need oil, then you need, you have certain um, procedures in place already. For high volume protection, we use a dry filter system with a spark arrest and fire suppression inside. And most of the dry filter systems actually have that built in. We use the, uh, Vario, the, we use the Keller Vario system. We've also used Hankey systems and they're all pretty, they all work pretty well. We haven't had any explosions that I'm aware of, so. Okay. That's all on safety. Uh, machine tool, in general, machine MQL has to be designed as a dry machine. So you don't want it, you want it to be steep vertical walls. You don't want to have a lot of flat spaces where chips can collect. You want to have an open bed to the chip drag. Um, you can have auger gravity shoes to move chips. We tend to use augers. Um, we want to protrude any type of a protruding bolt or pipe or exposed pipe or wire, anything that can grow a little beard of chips. It catches one chips and then it catches more, and pretty soon you've got a big long, just like a bee's nest of them. And this applies to fixtures as well as a machine. And most of the internal walls we either paint with, either use stainless steel or we use special paints to uh, reduce chip adhesion so the oily chips don't stick to it. So really, a lot of these modifications are just to prevent chips from collecting inside the machine. In the architectures, we use, uh, well, we kind of favor A-axis architectures. Um, this shown here, for example, because, and the main reason there is you can, uh, you can either rotate them 
to dump chips, or you can machine upside down and the chips just fall to the ground. So it's a really good architecture for that for dry machining in general. Um, that's always, first off, almost all automatic machines are, auto, are horizontal spindle because of, uh, actually it's for untended operation and also for safety and maintenance. So you don't see a lot of vertical machines. So these will all be horizontals, A-axis, and it's probably our, our preferred um, architecture. However, quite a lot of B-axis machines out there as well. Should, these are better for gantry loading. If you have a double axis, you pull back. So we still use quite, if you're doing deep hole drilling or something, you need these machines. So we can do these as well. Um, again, you have basically the same tape rules, except this time you really have to look at how you do your fixture in your B table to make sure there's not a lot of protruding stuff there or flat surfaces where we can collect chips. So it increases the engineering challenge, but we're, we and other people are doing this all the time. Uh, yeah, now obviously when you have a high feed operation, and most of our MQL we run a higher feed than wet, um, you're going to have to take into account that as you get to the top of that B table, the stiffness is lower, so you sometimes have to adjust the feed. Um, when we take a standard machine and modify it, Tim talked a little bit about it, but we basically do three things. Um, one is we integrate the unit. You've got to find somewhere to bolt it on the machine. Generally, that's near the back of the spindle because it minimizes your pipe lengths. Then we have to have a special rotary union and lance. The rotary union must be two-channel oil and air. That's why we call it two-channel MQL. Also, it has to be run dry without a coolant bleed off. A lot of wet unions actually use some of the coolant for lubrication. That's not going to work in MQL. Uh, Lance, as Tim said, runs from the rotor union to the tip of the spindle and it sticks out a little bit into the tool holder. So that you need a basically coolant tube bed in the middle of the spindle, otherwise you can't do that. Um, and actually probably one of the bigger problems or one of the bigger tasks is controls integration. You need to have some M codes turn the, machine, the MQL system on and off and sometimes you can use coolant commands for that. And you also have to, uh, if your machine faults out because there's no coolant pressure, for example, you're going to need to disable that fault because you won't have any coolant pressure. So things like that. Actually, we found the controls partly because ours are so complex because they have to talk to the factory system. This is one of the more challenging pieces is the controls. Talk about the design of the machining process and dimensional control. This is our big problem thermal expansion, and I've shown a little bit there. If you have a bar of length L and temperature T, you increase delta T, then the delta L is actually, well, the main the culprit here is this thermal expansion coefficient, which is 22 microns per meter per degree C for aluminum. So if you think about it, if you have a part where the locating holes are 40 centimeters apart, so like 16 inches, um, and we have parts like that, if you heat those up 10 degrees, they're going to grow 90 microns. <coughs> So that's almost four thou. And we've had cases where if before, in the early days, before we understood all this, we couldn't get the parts on the fixture because they wouldn't stick it, they wouldn't line up with the dial holes. So we really got to control. That's our big problem is the temperature. How do we hold this tension? And again, we don't have the water-based coolant, controlled temperature coolant that we use in most other operations. Well, what causes heat buildup in parts? One is ambient temperature variation, which is not processed morning to evening and summer to winter in a lot of plants. The big one is chips in contact with the part. If you get chips in the part, for example, on the right there's a transmission We're trying transmission case. We're trying to bore that main bore and we got a bunch of chips in there. That's going to heat that part up. And also a big problem is chips and drill flutes. When you're drilling, the chips are in the flute and that's a relatively slow process by many standards. So you got a lot of contact time there. So we really try to run very high feed rates and drill, get in the part and back out because if we don't, we get a lot of problems with the heating up the, the drills. Um, roll form taps, we don't cut a chip, all, of, all that heat goes into the part. It's not a lot of heat, but if you, if you tap a bunch of holes on the part, it adds up. Um, we have low speed and high flank wear processes. The main place where we see this is the middle of a drill is very slow. So you're going to get a lot of adhesion and build up there typically if you don't do it correctly. Abrasive work materials we haven't done a lot with, but we know that will cause problems as well because you'll get flank wear heating the part. And order of operations, oddly enough, we want to do the highest heat operations at the end of the cycle, not the beginning. For example, if we look at a transmission case from our Van Dyke plant, 6FM transmission, um, we're using, first of all, we're using higher feeds to, in drilling to reduce the heat into the part. This also cuts our cycle time, which is a bonus. Uh, we try, whenever possible, to reduce content per operation, so there's time between operations for the part to cool. But actually our current trend, because we've gone to five axis machining, is quite the opposite. Now we've gone to, instead of a bunch, we've gone to three or four operations total, because we only have three or four fixed rings. So actually, we're really 
we're, we have other ways to deal with this, but this actually is a, it creates a problem for us in MQL. And probably the best is to do the high heat cuts at the end of the operation to avoid dimensional changes. For example, this is a transmission case that we see on the right-hand side at the very end where you're doing the, the main and the pump bores in the middle of the case. That's where you put all the heat in the part because all those chips collect in those bores. So this is a well-designed process and they did that last. But, you know, you're going to have both the machine heat up and the part heat up, so you need to have some way to control the strategies. Um, you know, obviously, we've already talked about some of them is how you design the machine can help you. Open bed steep walls. Uh, some people do thermally isolate parts of the machine from the machine frame to try to, to hold, like, have a safe zone in there. I've seen, I haven't seen that actually work, but I've seen that, it, that people have tried it. And then, obviously, the screws and bolts. Um, there's basically two ways that we can control the temperature of the part we're machining. One is comp. We measure it in the machine. We have sensors in the machine that measure temperatures, and we have an algorithm, and we comp either the tool path or the offsets to bring the dimensions back into line. That is the method that we used in almost, that's the method we use in pretty much all of our current plants. Um, and it's, it's, it does require sensors and an algorithm. The sensors are actually not, they're not very reliable by our standards, so we tend to replace a lot of those. That's probably been the big problem there. Nobody really builds those temperature sensors to the type of duty cycle we're looking at. Um, the other way to do this is part temperature control, which is just waiting between ops or cooling tunnels between ops. So only start when the part is in a certain temperature range. Uh, we're talking about implementing that standard uh, for our next systems. Um, I, that requires paid rating periods and cooling tunnels, additional capital. It also requires a lot of discipline that nobody in the plant is going to figure a way around that to make parts. So I'm actually, I have some I guess I was one of the voices that said no on that, but I was outvoted. We'll see how that works out. Other thing we do, and we actually do this in wet plants, um, is we air temper the plant, meaning we don't let the, the temperature go all these wild springs. We try to keep it within 20 and 30 C, so that's 72 to like 90. And we also change the rate of temperature. We try to control that so it doesn't change too fast. Um, and we actually do that in our wet plants as well because some of the parts we make is just, it's not the old days where we walk into an unheated barn. And I mean, we have, we assemble our transmissions in, in clean rooms, right? So we have a lot of high, this is a high precision business, so we do need to control these temperatures. And we do this independently of MQL. Another thing air tempering does, people work harder, we get more productivity because they're not freezing or boiling. I'll say a little bit about our oils. Requirements, and I think Tim went through it, the two main ones are they have to have a very high lubricating ability because you're not using very much. And then they also have to be non-toxic and biodegradable because we're actually releasing these things into the world, so we're not collecting them, so they're going to build up in the workplace. So if you're putting a bunch of toxic oil or non-biodegradable oil, it's going to build up all over your floors and eventually, you know, eventually it's going to be bad. Um, we have some additional specifications for our own standards, uh, viscosity, flash point, ignition temperature, and explosion limit. These are all fairly easy to meet. Lots of oils do them. Um, but most of these, especially the, the first two, the, the high lubricating ability and biodegradability, tend to drive us toward vegetable oil-based lubricants. Uh, just because they're inherently biodegradable, and they tend to be better lubricants because they've got big molecular weights. For example, this is a slide I got from Quaker Chemical many years ago. Look at a chemical formula for mineral oil at the top. It's relatively simple. We go to a typical vegetable oil, much more complex, usually three, four times as big. So generally those are better lubricants and they're more viscous. But we also, we don't use straight vegetable oils because they spoil, right? They go bad. So we modify those for shelf life. So if you look at a synthetic ester, which is a common type, it's an even bigger molecule still. So those are, tend to be very good lubricants compared to a thinner mineral oil. So there are basically two types that we've seen. In the early days, we did pretty much all synthetic ester. Synthetic ester actually came out of the early MQL research in Japan. Uh, Japan, they have something called the uh, pollution release register. So you had to register for that, and they made it a, so biodegradability was a big deal. And so actually, the early research on that is really, they picked synthetic ester because it's biodegradable, not necessarily for this best machining performance. It's a very good lubricant, but it has a relatively high flash point, so it tends to leave more of a, it has more of a tendency, it doesn't give you a lot of evaporative cooling, and it tends to leave residue on the part, especially if you use too much. So generally, this was what was always recommended for aluminum, um, but we were actually not, and we, were, we used this in early programs, but we're not currently using it. 
The other type of oil is a fatty alcohol oil. This actually came out of Germany. For example, there's a University of Stuttgart system from the early 90s. Um, it's got a lower molecular weight, but also a lower flash point. So it gives you this little, little worse lubricant, but it gives you more evaporative cooling. It also leaves a lot less of a residue on the part, and it won't clog the filters up. The other problem we have is we clog the filters up. It screws up our filters, the esters. They have chemical reactions with the uh, washer fluids sometimes. So this was recommended for cast iron in the past. We use this for everything right now. Uh, since, since 2016, we've qualified this for iron and aluminum. And the big advantage here is in our engine plants, we have two types of machining, aluminum, and then the cranks are iron or steel. We'd like to use the same oil for both. In early days in Cologne, we used different oils, and then you've got to keep track of them. You have different filter systems. Uh, in our recent installations, we use one oil. So that's really the reason we went this direction. Dosage is something that Tim talked about, which is how, much, how many milliliters an hour do you need? And the answer is nobody really knows. In theory, you want to use enough so that you get good lubrication so there's no buildup on the tool but not so much that, the, that there's actually oil on the part. Um, in practice, in high volume production where we got a lot of variation in the tooling assemblies, this is simply not possible. When people have a problem, they tend to turn the oil up because it solves the problem, so then, and they never turn it back down, so we tend to use more oil over time. Um, we, we set largely based on experience. Um, we're not getting a lot of guidance from Munist or anybody else, uh, so we don't really know what this M is in the MQL. This is something that we work on constantly in time, and some of this is part dependent, something you have to figure out. But what if you have too much oil? For example, here on the right is a fixture we got back from a runoff after 30 pieces of oil, and it was like dripping, 30 pieces, so we made 30, I think these were engine heads, and man, it was dripping with oil, so they're obviously using a lot of oil. Um, you get oil buildup in the workspace and caking in the machine. Uh, you get residue on the part, which can interfere. Uh, if you use, for example, sealants, we use RTV to seal gaskets. It, it interferes with that. Clogged or damaged filters. Oily chips. Uh, at least in the state of Michigan, you can't transport those in the road. You have to press the oil out because they only be dry. And that's, I think that varies by jurisdiction. Uh, you get dimensional errors and misloads because you'll have chips on the locators, and you can actually damage a spindle socket because you, you keep clamping and unclamping and get in there. So you really we really work a lot with our plants to reduce oil usage to the extent we can. Why does that, why does the dosage vary? All right, well, there's a couple of things. One is we don't know, lack of physical understanding and well-defined method to select oil levels means we basically don't know what we're doing, so we're still working on that. Uh, some variation in calibration on certain systems. There is uncontrolled variation in tooling, and I think that is our biggest concern. Uh, position, condition, and size of the MPL ducts, we've shown some variations here. A variation in drill point grinds, variation in tooling assemblies, especially the different pipes in that and how we error proof that. But I mean, probably one of the big problems is you need to solve a problem for delivery, to make parts. If you, if you can make parts by turning the oil up and you can't without doing it, you'll turn the oil up every time. And as I said, once they turn it up, they never turn it back down. And that's my part of the talk. Now I think uh, with that discussion of uncontrolled variation, uh, Ethan is going to talk about the. Okay, so as Dave mentioned, um, getting the oil to the tooling assembly is only the uh, first half of the equation, then you have to carry it through the tool, so that's what I'm going to walk us through. So the three topics we're going to talk to to compare this is we're going to compare MQL tooling to standard flood coolant, um, and I broke it down into three points, obviously this is a high level summary, but we're going to talk about the interface connection point of how we transfer the MQL through the tool assembly. We're also going to talk about some of the premium materials and premium geometries that MQL drives in our tools. And then finally, I'll wrap it up with uh, some intricate internal geometries that ensure we have good flow through these tools. So from the picture up at the top, this is a standard shrink fit MQL uh, tool holder, um, HSK. And as you can see, the lance comes in from the far left and you enter the mixing chamber. Whenever, whenever we talk about dull channel through spindle, the one benefit is that we have this mixing action in the same point regardless of the tool. So whenever we do a tool change, we're starting from the same spot. Um, this is where the aerosol mist is developed. The lance is overhung by a little bit to have a venturi. You create the aerosol mist and then you carry it up through a takeover element to what's called here the adjustment screw. Um, from this point, it acts like a manifold and it puts the oil down the holes of the tool. Um, we want proper mixing of the MQL mist, so all of these 
uh, components are dimensioned under a DIN standard, um, as well as the cone interface. So that on the back of the carbide or your, uh, your tool geometry, you'll see we normally have a cone for MQL tools with a slot drilled across it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But for forward powertrain operations, we normally use a 90 degree cone interface, which I have a little more detail on in the next slide here. So um, there's a lot of guidelines around this interface on the shank of the tool. And what this does is it minimizes any dead space in the MQL system. So as your aerosol is already developed, you don't want to have any voids in that system because you can have pulling or collection and uh, pressure issues. So this, this method takes a uh, straight channel of MQL aerosol and it divides it into the two channels or multiple channels in your shank. Um, does it pretty efficiently. And as you can see, there's a lot of dimensions around this. This are the Gurren guidelines for uh, the shank interface. And as you can see, there's also a good example as well as a bad example of what can happen if you don't grind these properly, right? If you miss grind these, that all adds up to dead space in the tool and you won't get the quick repeatable response that you want at the cutting edge. So the dimensions vary with diameter. We don't usually require a slot for straight through tools. If you're going from a straight pipe to a, a hole that goes through, say a tap, we don't, there's no need for that slot. But for anything that's dividing up and you need it to act like a manifold, this uh, slot and uh, 90 degree cone work very efficiently. talk a little bit about taps because they're a little different. For bottoming taps, you would normally see we have a straight hole that goes from the uh, takeover element through transfer tube and then up through the tap body. We don't branch those out, so there's no need for that slot. But the one thing that's different about taps is you need to seal your MQL circuit. So you don't want air to go out the collet. So there's unique ways that uh, suppliers have to seal that as well as they need compressibility because as you clamp down the collet, you don't want to crush any elements and block your flow. Um, for chamfer taps, you'll normally see a straight channel up the tap and then they'll break out um, at 90 degree angles to coat the uh, cutting or roll forming edges. Cut taps, you'll normally see higher relief angles as well as higher back taper. And you'll have narrower lands compared to a wet tap. And this is all to reduce the, uh, the friction and heating. In the case of a roll form tap, there's no chip, so that heat goes right into the part. So we need to lubricate it as best we can. Um, form taps should be designed for MQL, so you'll see a lot of coatings to reduce friction. As I said, you'll need special sealing elements for a collet. You can see in the picture here, there's a sealing disc at the top of the, uh, at the, top of the collet there. There's a little sealing disc that says SD. And then you'll also see on the back end, right where that tube comes in, sometimes you'll see an O-ring. Those are all very uh, supplier determined. And you'll normally see a torque that's lower than wet tapping with MQL just because of the improved lubrication of using MQL. As I said, there's some better materials that are required for MQL, and this is due mainly in part because of the higher temperatures. Um, you don't have the flood coolant that cools the part, so there's going to be heat that's involved with this process. We also run higher uh, cycles or faster cycles, more aggressive, so there's higher stresses in these tools. With that, it drives us to use better and better grades of carbide, finer and finer grades. Um, so you'll see micro-grade carbides for strength and heat resistant in aluminum machining. And in Ferris MQL, you'll see finer grades, as well as some of the uh, new hardened metal grades, ISO H, super alloy, ISO S substrates. But basically, this is what drives the cost of the tool up for MQL machining. With MQL, we also like to keep a, uh, a keen eye on edge preparation and surface finish. For aluminum, we don't want to throw a burr, so we use, normally use an upsharp edge, and we want that edge to be uniform across the entire cutting surface. Uh, with PCD tools, they generally have a larger grain size, so we need to make sure that we polish that PCD and remove any machining slag, and we use the finest grain available. Um, for drills, you also see that there's polished flutes, so that once the chip is formed, it can efficiently leave the chip flute without sticking anywhere. In Ferris MQL, due to these more aggressive cycle times, we are generally making, we're more concerned about the strength of that cutting edge and resistance to chipping out. So you'll see a, a large hone or a, uh, a consistent hone. And you also see chamfers on these uh, Ferris MQL tools to distribute, that, to distribute that load a little better. Um, the uniform edge isn't as critical as compared to aluminum, but we definitely need edge strength here as the big uh, takeaway. On the right, you can see what an aluminum one looks like on the top compared to the uh, 50 micron hone on, for instance, a valve seat cutter, which is Ferris MQL. 
One of the other things that's critical in MQL is the airflow. Um, the airflow is what carries your oil to the cutting edge, but it also carries the chip out of the hole. So there's a lot of rolls around um, making good flow in these tools. And Comet uh, has a, some guidelines here from their handbook. Basically, you don't want to make any, okay, wrap it up. Um, you don't want to make any right angles. You don't want to have any surges in there. You want everything to be gradual and slow so that it has great flow. Um, you also want to direct the MQL as close to the cutting edge as you can because it's not going to travel as far as, for instance, a uh, flood tool. The handbook recommends large, uh, or Unisys handbook recommends a minimum passage of 0.5. From our experience, we like to go 0.6 or greater. And we see that, that the, the size of that hole is critical to your success in MQL machining. And then lastly, the one that says you don't want to have any any abrupt stops, everything needs to be gradual if you're gonna neck it down. There's three methods of making these, be it extrusion, preform, or EDM. Um, extrusion, you're gonna have the best, uh, most repeatable process as these are extruded from a die and they're readily available. Preform, they're done in the green state where they uh, drill out these holes for your MQL path. And then in EDM machining, you're gonna do it once the uh, tool body's finished, whether it's steel or sintered carbide a little more variation in these colon holes and how they uh, intersect with one another. And then the last point we want to bring up here is your balance, you're setting a MQL uh, amount of oil at the rear of the tool. For some of these tools where you have multiple um, ports or multiple cutting edges, you need to make sure that that geometry is balanced at each um, cutting diameter. For this example here, there's four different cutting edges. So we need to make sure that we get the right amount of MQL for the right amount of metal we're removing. So they need to be in balance. It's something we need to look at and tool suppliers have ways of doing this, but improper balancing can lead to premature tool failure. So we just wanted to bring this up as something to pay attention to as you design some of these more complex tools.